Day two of the hunt was a wash. Details aren't important here, but I will say this. If you're hunting with a guide and the guide says, wait there, wait there. So we pick up on day three. We covered a lot of ground. While the two Daves went with the other guide, Rick and I set off in search of cows or bulls or pretty much any live elk. We saw a lot of pretty country, but not much in the way of elk, except for one little herd that caught us flat-footed and in the open. As day three wore down, it was soon evident that our only reward for all the ground we covered was scenery. At last light, we had a sort of encounter, but the wind was wrong and we couldn't make it work. The lack of elk didn't keep us down too much. I still enjoyed a great time, with great company, in a beautiful place. By day four, we all knew time was running out. It was time to get pretty serious. To get The problem with trying to video my own hunt is that I can't capture the coolest parts. As evening settled and the temps dropped, a group of cow elk started calling. A few hundred yards away we heard the bull. We slipped in between and Rick called. As we discussed how to set up, the bull suddenly appeared. It's the big boy from day one. Unfortunately, he had us at 40 yards with no way to draw the bow. He couldn't smell us, but he could see we didn't belong. He stared a hole in us for a few seconds, then turned and trotted away stiff-legged. Just out of sight, he barked twice. Rick thought he could call him back. We adjusted position and Rick dropped back in above me. Within minutes of calling, I saw the big horns coming back through the brush. The knoll he had stopped behind last time was at 39 yards. I just needed him to cross over. As he slowly moved closer, I came to full draw. My arms began to shake as the big boy dawdled, but he was still coming. His head cleared the hill, and my heart began to pound so hard I felt my eyes bulge with every pulse. My release was tight, and my hand was beginning to tingle and go to sleep. But just a few more steps. That's all I needed. But he stopped. He looked up toward where Rick was calling, and then looked back down the hill. With a lunge, he spun and charged back down. I was about to give chase, when the small 5x5 five five from before suddenly trotted up the far side of the ravine. He stopped, about 70 yards away, and gazed sort of longingly toward where Rick had called. But with a glance down the hill, he sauntered the other way into the oaks. I followed his gaze, though, 
and saw the big antlers coming back up. Unfortunately, this time he followed the ravine, and I could only see his head. He topped the hill at about 60 yards. It's a shot I practiced, but he kept moving, trying to find that hot cow. He went behind the brush patch, and I kept waiting for him to step down. If he came out on either side, I'd have a perfect opportunity. He moaned and whined less than 40 yards away, but I couldn't see through the oaks. Finally, he turned and followed the other bull into the distant oaks. I watched as he disappeared and listened to him in the trees for a little while before he finally went back downhill to his cows. This was the experience I'd come for. Sure, I'd love to have put an arrow in him, or even in the small 5x5, five five, but the excitement and anticipation as I watched that majestic beast, never knowing if I would get the shot or not, well, that made my trip complete. On day 5, the camera pretty much stayed in my pack. I captured a little bit more scenery, but the truth is, the elk were quiet. It simply wasn't happening. The high temperatures during the day kept the elk in their beds uh, pretty much right after sunrise and kept them from bugling. So as the day wore on, I put the camera away and just enjoyed my last walk in the woods.